This is a Going Back, Remembering UGA interview with Dr. Emery Thomas and Francis Tolliver Thomas, two mainstays in the preservation of the heritage of the University of Georgia, Athens, and the South. Today, March 31st, 2015, we are visiting with the Thomases in their home on Hampton Court, only a few blocks from the University of Georgia campus. Others with us today include Alice Vernon and videographer Bill Evelyn, members of the Going Back crew, and I am Fran Lane. Fran and Emery, thank you for letting us drop in today. Thank you. Yeah, we're delighted. Maybe we should define the phrase mainstays before we go any further. Dr. Thomas Emery taught at the University of Georgia for 35 years and retired as a University of Georgia Regents Professor in History. And Mrs. Thomas Fran is the author of A Portrait of Historic Athens in Clark County, described by one publication as the definitive account of a place that makes history each and every day. And we're going to make some history today. Uh, <laughs> we're going to make it up. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's the best kind, but let's start at the beginning. Talk a little bit, tell me about your families, your early schooling, growing up in Richmond. Fran, we realize that you were born a Yankee but came south. <laughs> very, uh, pretty, very quickly came south. Tell us about what Richmond was like in the 1940s and 50s. Richmond was like a movie set of what you see of the 1950s, just uh, a very sort of uh, idealistic, I, uh, Dwight Eisenhower sort of era where everybody uh, uh, pretty much lived by the rules. Um, and uh, when we were younger and growing up, it was pretty clear how we were supposed to act and so forth. Emory was deeply involved in sports, lived in the north side of Richmond. I lived in the West End. Yeah. Um, yeah Richmond, I don't think of Richmond as, as being very much about rules. And uh, uh, I, we went to the Presbyterian Church at that time, and uh, which was right near the Presbyterian Seminary uh, in Richmond. and. Uh, actually, Burtis Downs lived uh, at, for a while in something called Mission Court, which was where the Presbyterians stowed their missionaries when they brought them back from wherever they were, darkest Africa or someplace, uh, brought them back to, uh, uh, I guess, Air Road <laughs> in uh, uh, supposed civilization and before they went back to uh, being missionaries, and Burtis was the son of some missionaries, and I found out later he attended the same elementary school that I did, uh, although a little bit later. <laughs> uh, we went, we met each other in high school, Thomas Jefferson High School, which at the time was supposedly one of the top ten public schools in, in the country. A very large, uh, diverse, uh, unfortunately at the time, of course not integrated. But uh, it was a wonderful high school with old line teachers who've been there forever. <laughs> so yes. we had a very classic sort of high school time. Was it Weegians and Madras jackets? Well, days, they, they had a saying that elephants couldn't go to TJ because they didn't make round Weegians. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it was Madras shirts and uh, we penny loafers and the whole routine. Crenlins. Round collars, circle pins, oh, gallows. Yes. I'm trying Absolutely. to remember. It is amazing as time goes along, and we'll talk about the 60s. I think dress says something about the culture of the day in terms of the way we live. Fran, you mentioned the sort of traditional following the rules, and then as time goes along, things begin to change, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there later. Talk to me about your early influences. Um, my early influence, I guess, was my parents and their friends, and um, I do remember wondering about the presidential election of 1948 when Harry Truman was reelected, and I couldn't see how that happened because nobody I knew had voted for him. Um, they'd all voted for the Republican Tom Dewey, and later, of course, uh, I saw the light. And, became a liberal Democrat myself, but that was a long time Went over coming. to the other side. Yeah. 
Talk about Dr. Douglas Freeman. Uh, Douglas Southall Freeman was the editor of the Richmond News Leader, which was the afternoon newspaper. He also wrote a four-volume biography of Robert E. Lee, a seven-volume biography of uh, George Washington, and th three volumes of Lee's Lieutenants, which was about the Army of Northern Virginia in the Civil War. He uh, was doing this and all the while editing the newspaper. Uh, I'm not sure when he found time to uh, sleep or eat. Uh, I think I've talked to his, uh, one of, the, well, his daughter, who said that uh, promptly at five o'clock in the afternoon, he practically clapped his hands and the children were supposed to come down and that was children time. And then uh, when that was over, he went back to eat or work or whatever he was doing and wake up at five in the morning and he had a morning radio show that nobody went to school until Dr. Freeman was through talking. And he talked from 8 to 8.15 every day, and so school started at 8.30. <laughs> Freeman's lifestyle was not a model for our home life and family life with our <laughs> Nor boys, mine. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so he told you what was going on in the world? Or yeah, he, 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 just... worked, he worked the news, and he commented on the news, and he kept talking about uh, people who got um, extremely excited about one crisis or another as the fire alarm boys. <laughs> Uh, as though they were raising the alarm against impending doom, and he was going to tell you how, the, how it really was, and that uh, doom was a, a bit put off. So he was a, a, a stable staple. He was. He was in the stability. Was a, well, although I was born in New York, I'm from some old Virginia families who spent a lot of time teaching you who your family was and, and ancestry, and fortunately that was pretty well documented, so I sort of always grew up knowing about that. I didn't have to go to Roots to find out about it. But, um, but the, in my family, it was just my brother and me, but we had lots of great aunts and great uncles, and we would be hauled off to Orange, Virginia, and these endless weekend visits with the oldsters kind of reminded me of Truman Capote with his aunts that he stayed with in the summertime. So, yeah, I had a different experience. My uh, my Thomas family came from uh, Gwinnett County, Georgia, uh, just down the road from here. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, my grandfather came into the end of a cotton row at age nineteen in nineteen hundred and walked up to the house and said, Mama, I will pick no more cotton ever. And he had a job, he thought, in Atlanta, which was a long way away from Gwinnett County in those days. But he found out the man could get him a job in Richmond, Virginia. So he got on the train and went to Richmond. And family legend has it that he had 35 cents in his pocket when he arrived. Uh, he later married my grandmother who was, uh, well, the, the daughter of a farmer in King William County. Virginian by many generations. And a Virginian too. many generations. And uh, anyway, my mother came from North Carolina, and my father used to tell her that, or used to proclaim that in North Carolina they taught you the way to read, the way to write, and the way to Richmond. <laughs> uh, her father was a doctor and worked out of his house. And we visited grandmothers, uh, and my one of my grandfathers had died before I was born, but I did grow up knowing my grandparents, which was a nice thing to have. And both of our fathers served in World War II. Right, uh, Fran's father was on a transport ship um, wandering around the Pacific, trying to avoid submarines and mines and my father was into anti-aircraft artillery, uh, served in Europe, uh, went over to France shortly after the Normandy landings and was with Patton's Third Army uh, attached to it in the race across France. He may have bumped into my dad. 
was an Annie oh. aircraft arrived shortly after. Oh we my have, gosh. We yeah. have childhood pictures, each of us in our families, of, of us, you know, at arms with the helmets on, little sandals <laughs> yes. on our feet. But that, that was... It was a hard the, time. It was. It was. You both attended Thomas Jefferson High School. Now, Fran, was Emory the football hero, or I realize that he was a bit older. Yeah, I can barely remember. No, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he played he played football, track, a lot of sports, and um, we uh, had a number of mutual friends. So eventually, fell into dating each other. But actually, mostly after he'd gone to college, and I was still there in nursery school. I mean, high school. <laughs> yes. Uh, Just, and and uh, he all, uh, tell him about being an exchange student to Belgium from high school. That was yeah, one of my enlightening experiences was that uh, we had exchange students and that was a very new thing in those days mm -hmm. and uh, we had Sabina Kleinbeck from uh, somewhere in Germany I forget where but she came and uh, because we had hosted her we got to send a student we thought and I applied and it turns out we got three students they had the, something called the American Field Service yeah which was an outgrowth of an ambulance corps in, I think, far back to World War I. Uh, the American Field Service sponsored these trips, and the, uh, the European students came up and stayed a, a whole year, school year, and the, uh, at that time, the Americans just went over for the summer. And so I spent uh, the summer with a family in Belgium uh, outside of Brussels, near, near Levin, and uh, that was, you know, I realized the world was extended. That was a big deal then. Yeah, because it extended beyond the bounds of the city of Richmond. You broadened your horizons mm -hmm. terrifically, I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah. What kind of shape was Belgium in then at that point? Were they it was recovering from the war. Uh, this was in 1957, yeah. and there were still bombed out buildings around. Uh, but the Belgians were really becoming prosperous, and uh, they were brewing Stella Artois down the road. And uh, I lived with a physician and his family, and he was a respected member of the community. And uh, we went on a uh, summer holiday to the Black Forest in Bel in Germany, wow. and it was a wonderful experience for me. I, uh, I realized after the fact how really stupid I was and took European history after I came back uh, and said, oh yeah, <laughs> that's what that was about. <laughs> oh, you all, we get you through high school. And Emory, I have a quote that I have seen you uh, quoted. It's, it's reported that you've said many times, much of what I've done in life is the right thing for all the wrong reasons. Precisely. <laughs> Would you like to expand uh, on that well, a little bit and as you start yeah, telling us about UVA and the University of Virginia and what? Well, I went to Virginia primarily to play football. Uh, and because I could, uh, they gave me a grant and aid and uh, I was a paid hireling uh, on their football teams. And I majored in history primarily because I got an A in history and a B in English. And uh, therefore, I didn't major in English. I um, got in the honors program because you wrote papers and didn't have to go to class. And I thought that was good. So uh, anyway, I went to graduate school primarily because I could. and. Uh, uh, got a PhD in history, mainly because I wanted to coach football, but wanted some insurance. <laughs> and then I got hooked on history, and that uh, I sort of gave up football for uh, uh, the rest of my, well, play, playing it and coaching it. I do think it's interesting that Amory was one of the first honor students in a little trial honors program at the University of Virginia, just two students. And essentially, he was tutored for the last two years of college. 
which was like wonderful. Being in he in read, read, you know, read his lessons and then met with the wow. professors. What an interesting experience. Well, it was. It was. Well, was what lit your fire about history? What finally? Um, I guess it was sitting in a carol in the Alderman Library at the University of Virginia, reading an uh, an essay by C. Van Woodward entitled "The Burden of Southern History," in which he argued that uh, the United States was all full of success and prosperity and progress and righteousness, and the American South was uh, a bit of a counterpoint to all of that. <laughs> that the South had experienced defeat and occupation and poverty uh, in the extreme and guilt and shame and all kinds of things, and that uh, the American South should be an, an example to the rest of the country that history is not just something happens that happens to other people, that uh, uh, we too can experience all manner of the human experience, uh, including defeat and uh, uh, something other than prosperity. Having lost all the football games that he lost, that put him in a good mind for understanding <laughs> Yes. Everyone was No, that? my career at Virginia was, let's see, we had um, freshmen or first yearmen had to play on a separate team, could not play varsity football, and we were one and four in our five games. I then played on two uh, 0 and 10 seasons for Virginia in the process of setting at the time, or tying at the time, we weren't even good enough to break the record for most losses in a row. Uh, we lost 28 straight games, uh, but I only played 20 of them. And uh, the next year, our coach was Bill Elias, who was named ACC Coach of the Year because we were four and six. We had a losing record, <laughs> but we were Virginia, and that was a remarkable coaching uh, uh, triumph. I don't know what to say, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say Studies that. Studies and defeat, that was my no, I w Well, maybe that's why Always I. Always for the underdog. <laughs> maybe that's why I became a Confederate historian, because I was used to getting beat up. Losing. And, um, mm. But. I will say that losing teams uh, work just as hard as winners, and harder in some cases, because the coaches are, get upset with you and make you uh, go out and run goal line scrimmages well, and they for an hour play, and a half. He, he played both ways, offense and defense, and the equipment wasn't as good either. So. It was a different day, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was. They had a very brilliant team, however, they went on to do fine things in life. Yeah, One we became had, governor of Kentucky, Brereton Jones. Yeah, I played with Brereton Jones, who was later governor of Kentucky, and uh, a, another good friend that I played football with, play, he was a big dumb tackle, who <laughs> later became the head of the pediatrics department at uh, Medical College of Georgia. And uh, my roommate, uh, who was another big dumb tackle, uh, <laughs> became the youngest partner in Price Waterhouse accounting firm ever made, and uh, went on to a, a very Several successful doctors, career. Well, that's what we would expect from a team <laughs> at UVA, so. Well. Um, Fran? Meanwhile, I was at Mary Washington College. There were no women at the University of Virginia, uh, except in the upper grade, uh, juniors and seniors in education and nursing, period. That was it, few in graduate school. Uh, so we were the women's division. The only thing was we were hidden 50 miles away over in Fredericksburg, Virginia. On purpose is my guess. Yes, Mary Washington College of the University of Virginia. That's now men and women, and they have a football team. But then it was certainly different. Uh, it's a beautiful campus and a beautiful drive from Charlottesville to University of Virginia, which I made many times in so a you taxi were cab on the road. stuffed with other girls going there. Yes, I made yes. many more times. <laughs> he made many more times, yes. exactly. But I did uh, ride horses in college, and one of the great benefits of that was you could wear your joppers and boots to class, and we were the only women on campus in pants. Who were allowed to do that. But you had to either be going to the stable or coming from it, at least near to the time you were going to the classes in between. 
was a great advantage, though. We, we need to compare some things later. So. You all married in 1963, is Two. that right? Two. 62? Yes. In Orange, Virginia, in a church, uh, Episcopal church that uh, had, uh, my, my grandmother had been married in that church wow. 40 years prior. And they, 40 years, is that right? Something like that. Uh, and um, they published the write-up of her wedding you know how small town newspapers give these huge write-ups on weddings. And it told about how they used the electric lights for the first time at my grandmother's wedding, how it was in a blinding blizzard in December, uh, who the wedding guests were and what they wore and what the wedding gifts were. <laughs> Ours wasn't quite that extensive, but almost. And we had a destination wedding before that became a yeah, vogue. Yeah, because we lived in Richmond, but we were married in, in Orange. Orange. You were cool. Which my father considered the local branch of heaven, so I had to be married there. <laughs> St. Thomas Episcopal Church, by the way. Yes, oh. yes. And then you went to Texas? Yeah, we, uh, I went to graduate school at Rice. Uh, again, it was probably the right thing for the wrong reasons. I went there because I'd never been to Texas and thought that would be fun. And the people at Rice were uh, very understanding of uh, the Army, uh, which had a, a hold on me uh, because of an ROTC commission. Uh, and they were in the midst of trying to get people out of the Army uh, that had been called up for the Berlin blockade. And so they uh, had a delay in uh, call to active duty. I mean, a, a delay in, in deferments from call to active duty, and it looked like I was going to have to go directly into the Army uh, because uh, graduate school in history was down low on their pecking order of priorities. If you were a physicist, you'd probably get your delay, but otherwise uh, it was get ready to, to go on active duty. And Rice was very, very good about saying, well, you know, let, it, let me know when you know something, and we'll hold your spot. And so they did, and I did, and the Army relented and granted my delay mm -hmm. from call to active duty. And so we went to, uh, we packed up a Volkswagen, a, a convertible, a covered wagon, and we went, went to west. Texas. <laughs> Move west. Culture shock that began to ensue moving from Richmond, Virginia to Houston, Texas. And it was when, uh, well, a lot of things happened. Uh, Kennedy was yeah. assassinated while we were there. Um, in, in Texas. In Texas. <laughs> uh, but um, the uh, astronauts were very much part of the town scene, and you could go downtown and actually see them on the streets. That was very exciting, any sighting of any of the astronauts. They were the heroes of uh, the time. Oh, yes. huge. Absolutely. So. Huge. Beyond celebrity yeah. status. And, well, Houston was also uh, sort of in the middle of, or the very end of, the oil boom. And so the, some of the uh, major wildcatters were still running around. And Texas was, well, compared to Eastern learning that I had been tasting in Virginia, Texas was a little wild and strange. And uh, it was... Um, I don't know. It, it, Lots to me, of big characters. And, well, yeah. Larry McMurtry was in graduate school with us. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Uh, very much around the scene. Yeah, my major professor uh, did not have a high school diploma. He was tutored by people in Austin where his father taught math at the University of Texas. Frank Vandiver. And Frank uh, uh, had no high school diploma, but enrolled at the University of Texas as a master's candidate because they were using one of his books in the class. <laughs> and so he said, you know, you, that's my credential. So he had no undergraduate degree, no high school diploma, and there he was working on his master's. Had this great, wonderful, deep voice, uh, very articulate. Yes. 
And is, uh, he, he worked with you on a study of Richmond, is that right? Well, yeah, and actually I tried to write a dissertation on a lot of different topics. Uh, I was gonna do an image study of Jefferson Davis, what people have thought about Jefferson Davis through the years, and I figured I wouldn't live long enough to read all the stuff that uh, people had thought about Jefferson Davis. So I, Frank had wanted somebody to do, well, he actually I wanted to do Virginia politics in the uh, post-Reconstruction era. And Frank said, well, if you do that, I'm not gonna direct it because politics is the opiate of the asses. <laughs> and uh, he had, uh, so he was tired of that and wanted me to do something else about, the, he wanted me to work on the Confederacy. So he wanted people to do studies of Confederate cities. And I said, well, okay, I'll do Richmond. And so I did. And that became my dissertation topic, Richmond during uh, the Confederacy. I always wonder about people's dissertations. Uh, was mine, it mine fun? Later. Was it interesting as you dug into things? Or was it drudgery? Uh, it was both. <laughs> Uh, mainly because I was in a hurry. Uh, I wanted to get on with life, and I knew I had the Army ahead of me. I had two years of active duty. I was obligated to, to serve. And so I wanted to get rid of the dissertation so I could get the Ph.D., so I could go in the Army, and then I could begin real life. He was only <laughs> in graduate school three years, so no master's degree went straight through for a Ph.D., which it was unusual, but right. you could do that then. Yeah, and that's another reason I went to Rice, is they had a three-year Ph.D. program. Let that, you do that. No, nobody got the degree, or some, very few people got the degree in three years, but you at least were programmed to do it, and people usually did it in four, which is amazing, because now it takes, you know, seven, eight, and nine, ten. And also his entire education was free, undergraduate athletic scholarship and graduate schools academic scholarship which we noted when we started paying for our boys. Yes. <laughs> Out-of-state tuitions and private much. college. I feel, I feel somewhat slighted then. Uh, <laughs> well, Fran was working, too. She worked in the library and in the Rice Development Office. And uh, When I got to Rice, they were celebrating their 50th anniversary, and I worked on that staff. And years later, I worked for the University of Georgia on the Bicentennial of the University of Georgia. So that was kind of interesting. They had um, a series of speakers. Arnold Toynbee was one and Margaret Mead was another. And I got to meet her, which was fun, you know, as uh, just a mm -hmm. baby child as I was then. I was basically a gopher for that office, but it was, it was good. It's amazing the things you bump into sometimes, aren't they? Just happen into Just us. happen to. Yeah. All right, Emory, you and Fran went on. You, you had two years in the Army and you were in Ohio. Yes, Was yes. Was anything um, memorable about that experience? <laughs> very few things. <laughs> the uh, pig farm across the street from our house. Uh, actually, it was, um, again, I was very fortunate because uh, you didn't have to I was in the home. Army from 1965 oh, to 1967, which was the, the period of time that uh, the United States became uh, significantly involved in Vietnam, and I was uh, just uh, too too much involved in air defense artillery, which uh, we fired missiles at airplanes. Uh, that uh, they couldn't, I didn't have enough time left in, on active duty to put me in Vietnam. Otherwise, I'd have been there. Lucky and, man probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> Lucky man. And then in 1967, you arrived in Athens as one of 400 new faculty hired to try to handle the huge influx of the baby boomer generation. Talk a little bit about those first years at Georgia, about life in LeConte Hall and where those new young professors were attempting to find their place in a department, <laughs> some of whose older faculty had been there for 50 years. Well. Uh, Lacan Hall was, uh, or two floors of Lacan Hall were our bailiwick. The political scientists were down on the ground floor. Uh, and I shared an office with six other people. We were known as the, 
uh, well, either the Magnificent Seven <laughs> in our uh, parlance or the Seven Dwarves, uh, as we were known otherwise. And there were some interesting people in there. Uh, Carl Vipperman, for example, later a uh, uh, mainstay at the university, and others who... Fantasy Spaulding. Fantasy got his own office, by God. Earlier than the rest of Yeah. <laughs> Um, but he, he, was, uh, he was new uh, from the College of Charleston. And anyway, we were all newly minted, more, more or less newly minted PhDs and were uh, assistant professors. And it was in that office that uh, I began teaching at the university. But I, that was okay because I really thought I was going to only stay here from you know, three to five years and move on to something else, because that's the way the profession worked at the time. Uh, however, the, there was an academic depression that set in in the early 70s, and you couldn't go anywhere. Uh, so I stayed here, and then when I finally got to the point that I could go other places and get other job offers, offers um, I found that I was having too much fun here. We're glad. <laughs> well, we're glad. So am I. You remember what the physical appearance of campus was like in 1967? Uh, 1967, well. Much smaller. It was much, much smaller. smaller. Much. Infinitely smaller. Uh, there were new dorms uh, packed in students on Baxter Street, uh, Brumby and Russell and uh, Cresswell and all those places. Uh, women, as in Fran's experience at Mary Washington, women had to wear skirts, uh, could not wear shorts, uh, or if they wore them, they had to be going to gym class and have a raincoat over them. Uh, that was a different world. <laughs> it was a different world. The uh, campus was always beautiful, but it wasn't as manicured as it is now. The beautiful trees were there, but they were much more casual. I mean, they might even have raked the leaves as opposed to blowing them at the time <laughs> and uh, maybe swept the sidewalks with brooms. It was, it was uh, different. I think it went from 12,000 to 20,000 while I was in school. Well, when we, when we arrived, I think it was 16,000. And on the way up, uh, now, of course, it's 35,000. Yeah, and the parking was Parking was still, a, still <laughs> an a issue. Booger. Yes. yes. Uh, we didn't have any parking decks, but um, we we were able to get if you got there early, which we did because we all all these low people on the totem pole had taught all the early classes had eight o'clock classes, so we got there early and got decent parking places uh, near Lacan Hall before they built the uh, library over what became what was. Our parking lot. I was going to say that parking lot was terraced. I don't right. know if you remember exactly. that. Dean it Tate was. went over it regularly. I don't know if you were aware. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. He went over, uh, I mean, if it was the shortest way to get out. Oh, okay. In his car. In his car, <laughs> yes. Ooh. So anyway. Well, when you started at Georgia, it was really an interesting time. 60s and 70s, 70s rife with student discontent from every different direction. Desegregation had happened at Georgia right. in 1961, only minimally. What was the racial climate like when you, when you came in 67? Um, well, there just weren't that many African American students, and that was a bit of a challenge. And actually, one of my office mates uh, was David Foley, was head of the African American Studies Program, uh, which attempted to attract African American students and offer courses in uh, African-American history. And he was an Africanist himself. Uh, but we weren't very successful at these things, uh, mainly because there was never a critical mass of African-American students at Georgia. And David Foley was not black. Right? Yeah, and he was um, actually a, <laughs> uh, a mainly a student. His dissertation was about uh, uh, colonization in Africa. I mean, he was a student of the, the Europeans 
uh, in effect owning Africa, which really didn't play well mm -hmm. um, <laughs> among Africans. And when African Americans were hired at the university in those days, uh, there used to be <laughs> essentially rush parties to try to get them to come to your neighborhood so that we could boast uh, having an African American in Cedar Creek or Green Acres or wherever. Uh, and the great hiring initiative, however, only occurred many years later, or several, well, 20 years later, uh, with Chuck Knapp, the president who succeeded Fred Davidson. Uh, Fred Davidson came to the university the same time Fred and I did uh, as president. He was th all of 37 years old at the time and was a... Uh, a veterinarian. A veterinarian in his in his uh, education, and uh, he was here for something like nineteen years, um, and presided really over uh, the transition of the University of Georgia from a essentially a deep south uh, college where you could get a good education, but you had to work for it. You had to had to pick and choose courses. Uh, to a really a fine uh, upscale university uh, in a league with, uh, well, I think North Carolina and maybe Virginia and other um, state universities. We've always aspired to be Well, and to then his emphasis on the biosciences and bringing in that whole. And the facilities for uh, those Facilities things. for that, amazing growth then too. You talked about Vietnam briefly, but, and you know, I always felt like things sort of hit our campus a year or two later than they later, hit in other exactly. places. And I, and the Vietnam early 70s more was, was yes. a time when yes. there was some pretty strong reaction. Do you remember? I remember the peace rallies, and uh, I remember uh, doing um, teach ins in which. Uh, you held class, but you essentially talked about war and the nature of war. And uh, since I was teaching class in the Civil War, I could talk about uh, warfare and the, uh, the devastating effect and uh, essentially teach against <laughs> the futility the, of war. The, yeah, the Vietnam War, which seemed increasingly unwinnable. Well, we also were in Italy uh, in 1974 with our family. Emory was a Fulbright professor to the University of Genoa, so we missed some of the things going on on campus then. But I do remember we got the International Time magazine and opened it up, and here was the bare bahancas of one of the students streaking through University of Georgia campus uh, in Time magazine, and our son... John, who was seven years old at the time, remarked to me, damn, what a time to be away from home. <laughs> well, well the streaking I, was a big event. I had not noted that as something that we needed to stress today. Oh, well, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was it interesting got because... It attention. And, I don't know, it was 1969 or 70, it was a huge, or for us, a huge rally uh, to... Uh, uh, argue for peace, and there were uh, estimated uh, 1,500 students there, which was exactly the number of estimated students who participated in the world's most populous streak, 1,500 students dashing across the bridge uh, behind Sanford Stadium. It was interesting, I think, that those two uh, events drew 1,500 students each. And Aunt Martha. Aunt Martha went with us to see the streaking. Oh, good. So that was really oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> Let's talk about women's rules. Uh, Emory, you've already indicated the story about the ladies who were, had to de dress differently from the gentlemen. Precisely. What, uh, did you see a lot of that in your class? Was there a lot of uh, fomenting by the girls, or was it just... Well, I remember there was one professor in the history department who was known as a woman hater, and 
generally known that women in the, uh, his classes received a one grade lower than they earned. If they earned a B, they'd get a C. Uh, and he really just didn't like women, didn't think they ought to be there. Uh, but that was rare, I hope. And uh, That was rare. Um, but curfews, of course, were in very much part of the scene, and you weren't having dating late at night or going out on the town late And at women night lived habits. in campus housing. In campus yes. housing and dormitories, right. And we tried to hire women in the department. Uh, and I guess we had one woman who taught uh, ancient history, Glenda Piper, and then we got Jean Friedman, uh, who really impressed me because they, when she arrived <laughs> for her campus interview, uh, and they were going to take her to lunch at the Holiday Inn. No, she had her own lunch with her, and it was very healthy kind of stuff. <laughs> and she was eating her... Uh, carrots and celery sticks? Uh, oh, yeah, carrots and such, and, and bran, uh, bran bars and things. <laughs> did you, you all hired her? Yes, we did, and Jean became one of my very, 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 good very friend great friends. Uh, she came and... <laughs> On one occasion, she walked in my office and said, uh, here's a petition. Uh, the, there's a sexist movement to have uh, Georgia girls to be helpful in the recruitment of football players. And uh, we think that is rampant sexism, and uh, this, per this petition protests it. And if you don't sign the damn thing, I'm going to break your arm. <laughs> I take it you signed. I signed it, yes. <laughs> she later, many years later, married uh, Bernie Dallenauer uh, after his wife died. He was quite a, a beloved professor at the University of Philosophy. You all knew all the, all the great folks. We but she, she hadn't married all those years, and then she married a man with grown children and Adapted to married life beautifully. They've had a very yeah. happy Jean, life. Jean is a wonderful now person. Now moved away from Athens. And we miss her a great deal. I'm going to go back to women's rules just briefly. Uh, Louise McBee tells us, or told us, that at one point the girls marched around campus. This would have been about 1968 with a little casket with a women's rules book Ooh. in the casket. <laughs> yes. And it was the death of women's rules. And they also occupied the academic, yeah, the building, academic building, which happened on several occasions, I think, in, yes. in the 60s and early 70s. But um, one of the biggest, as, as you've mentioned, Emory, uh, earlier, possibly before we were talking on, on Bill's film, um, changes in the way that women are involved at the university and their lives at the university have been some of the major changes, yes. wouldn't you say? Yes, indeed. I think it's... it's uh, we sort of, I would like to say, presided over, but in some cases responded to uh, the growth of feminism and uh, the equality of women in society. Um, and that occurs in the classroom and in uh, the hires as well. Plus, there are more women now at the University of Georgia, substantially, exactly. than there are men. We're going to outnumber y'all. I know, I know. Uh, which I think is wonderful, uh, but it, uh, I don't know, it, it may be um, some strange phenomenon, I'm not sure what, what provokes all this, because it's, it's, it's um, happening in colleges all over the country. Absolutely. Um, and maybe it was time. Maybe it I was suspect, time. I suspect. With all that stuff going on, you were mesmerizing history students with your sandbox. Talk well, about I discovered, that. I discovered that um, I really could understand battles. And we talked about Douglas Freeman earlier, but his description of descriptions of battles often baffled me because he was talking about uh, regiments uh, attacking this flank and out of these woods, and I didn't, where is that? What's going on here? And I found that the, I could really understand battles best if they were portrayed in a National Geographic form with uh, 
uh, little drawn figures <laughs> coming out of these woods and uh, other drawn figures looking down from this hill. So I said, well, you know, maybe st students would understand battles best if I did something like this. And so I uh, sculpted terrain with a, uh, in a sandbox. The first one was uh, I had to <laughs> the uh, physical plant build it. And they went ballistic and made a four by, I mean, a four feet by eight foot uh, sandbox on wheels. And I would roll that sucker out and create, before the class, uh, the terrain uh, with dribble water on Well, first the, you had to get the bags of sand. Yeah, Pretty well, I had to get the sand sandbox. in there. So I had to borrow a, a Lester Langley's pickup truck and go out with a bunch of students and say, well, today's activity <laughs> is going to be to go get the sand. Uh, you know, you, you, and you come with me. The rest of y'all go home uh, or talk to yourselves or do something. Uh, so we went and got the sand. And the reason, <laughs> the way we discovered uh, how much sand to get from the university's sand pile was when the truck got too low on its springs that it was about to, to fall through, we said, okay, that'll do it, and went over to Lacan Hall and shoveled the sand in the Well, didn't they box. used to make you take it down, but finally let it just stay up in the classroom all the time? Well, I, yeah. Um, I had, um, well, students put cats in there sometimes. Oh, no. Uh, and, and then, uh, <laughs> On one occasion, I borrowed from Flannery O'Connor and with the beginning of Wise Blood, her novella, in which <laughs> this guy, the, the main character, puts a sign on his uh, shiffer robe that says, this shiffer robe belongs to Hazel Motes, and anybody tampering with it will be hunted down and killed. <laughs> well, I put the, that a sign similar on that sandbox, and the, unfortunately, the night janitor didn't, hadn't read Flannery O'Connor, <laughs> and he got really afraid that I was threatening him. So uh, he went to the head of the department and said, you know, I'm reading, I've got this sign that threatens my life. So anyway, I took that down. Uh, but I finally got, I used Monopoly uh, houses and hotels. Uh, I sprayed green paint on the grass, on what, I hoped it was grass, um, and uh, uh, used HO scale, scale soldiers that I could buy that from uh, railroad model railroad uh, supply places, and found that I, in moving these soldiers around one at a time, that didn't work too well. So I glued them onto popsicle sticks, and uh, so they could march moved, together. You know, six or ten at a time. <laughs> And uh, it was a way to show students what's, you know, how a, a battle uh, progresses and who's coming from where and why this hill's important and why that... Former students used to like to come back. To see yeah, I had students coming back. And I guess the crescendo of the whole event was something called the Battle of the Crater in which uh, Union troops uh, figured out a way to dig a mine, uh, a tunnel, under the Confederate works and plant uh, 8,000 pounds of gunpowder and then set it off and create, the idea was to blow a hole in the earthworks and then pour troops through it to uh, break the siege of Petersburg and break the, uh, the, the stalemate that the trenches uh, had created. And so I'm would work, actually, this, this would take some time. I would go over and uh, usually often in the evenings and create the, uh, the earthworks and use little uh, toothpicks as uh, 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 punji stakes and things and uh, create something called a chevaux de frise, which is a bunch of uh, uh, stakes there that uh, it was really a an early form of concertina wire that discouraged attacks. And 
and then I would dig a, dig a hole under the Confederate works, plant some firecrackers, and then cover them up, and then set the firecrackers off. And that would be the, the crater, which is what happened. They blew a hole in the Confederate works. They poured troops in, but the troops had treated it like tourists and just spent their time saying, oh my golly, look, look, my God, what, is, what has we done here? And started dragging cannon out of it to capture the, the guns. And what they were supposed to do, of course, was pour through there and uh, hold the shoulders of this gap and uh, break the whole stalemate of trench warfare. Uh, they, the troops who sent in didn't know what to do and weren't rehearsed at it. Uh, and when the troops who was, had some idea of what to do came in, it created a whole mess. And by that time, the Confederates came back and it was literally shooting fish in a barrel. So that was fun with all the little I was getting ready to say, they loved it. Yeah. I know, because yeah. I would hear about it. They loved it and, and they learned something. Well, yes. of course, what? you didn't have PowerPoint in those days. No big entertainment features through computerization. Just those nasty old maps that could barely right. roll back up over top of the blackboards or your chalk to write on the blackboards. So, so it, that's what it one reason it was so popular. became clear. Anyway, right. that was great fun. <laughs> well, you were, you were plotting battles in your sandbox and you were writing books. So let's talk about your books for a minute. You, you wrote nine books during well, your 35-year tenure. Yeah, I, uh, I finally got my dissertation published. Um, it took some significant revisions. And in the middle of that, I had a, an idea that really came out of a class. Uh, the conventional wisdom says that uh, all these guys are just uh, teaching is their day job. They're really just writing books, and why should we fund that when, uh, as part of their salaries? Uh, but no, uh, research has always informed my teaching and been a uh, exciting part of what I do. And a class that I was uh, uh, trying to offer some uh, insights into the significance of the Confederacy in Southern history uh, provoked uh, a lot of discussion and conflict. And I remember that on the final exam, I asked essay questions and they, practically everybody began with, I contend. <laughs> Uh, contention being the significant phrase there. And in the middle of it all, I came away with some ideas that I honed into a book called The Confederacy as a Revolutionary Experience. Uh, and I managed to send a five-page prospectus off to some publishers and one crazy guy at a place called Prentice Hall uh, thought that would be a nice idea. And he was willing to pay me an advance, a huge advance of $500, which I thought was monstrous at the time. It was. Uh, and so I wrote the book in about nine months. Uh, it was not, you know, it's about a 150 page book, but I was just working fast and furiously. And really that became sort of my, uh, my mantra of what I did. The Confederacy is important, it's significant, and here's, what, here's why, and you have uh, a bunch of people who are trying to create a nationality for themselves while in the midst of a huge war. And in many ways, they succeeded and did some things you wouldn't expect them to do under the pressure of war. And I also claim that uh, con the conflict and pressure and crisis, particularly crisis, uh, makes people react and reveal who they really are. Uh, and we celebrate that, I think, in our culture by things like job interviews, <laughs> uh, goal line stands, uh, sudden death, 12-point tiebreakers uh, that s over times that supposedly reveal who you most are in the midst of a contest, and I think wartime does that with with people, and does certainly did with the Confederates because they're busy losing the war for much of the time. 
on to your next book. Well. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, then I tried to write a textbook uh, called The American War and Peace, a poor parody of uh, War and Peace. Uh, but the American War and Peace was the American Civil War, and so I tried to write about the Civil War and Reconstruction. And in, next? In uh, maybe two or three hundred pages. And then I wrote uh, something called The Confederate Nation, which was uh, really a, a distillation of the ideas from revolutionary experience, uh, sort of uh, trotted out there a little bit broader. Uh, the Confederate Nation was a uh, part of a history series of the new, called the New American Nation series, which supposedly had books about every uh, portion of American history and was uh, uh, at the time pretty standard as the place, the go to place if you want to read a. a um, and this, this series was edited by Henry Steele Commenter and Richard R Morris. Richard Morris. And they were getting on in years, Log of Two, particularly Henry Steele Cominger. And he was hanging out at Lake Como in Italy, and Emory was trying to get his revisions back from Henry Steele Cominger. And that was a, a hair tearing yes. <laughs> time. It seemed to take forever he, he to get was those busy. back. Well, he was I think busy. He was, he was also busy being famous. Right. That's what he was busy yeah. being. Henry yeah. Steele Cominger, that is. He was he very was, busy uh, being famous. And I think he really, you know, he sort of had an idea of what should go in this book. Uh, but he didn't want to write it, so he wanted me to write it for him, in effect. And I had some other ideas that uh, conflicted with his, and I I just outlasted him. Uh, Frank Turned Vandiver, out very well. <laughs> Frank Vandiver, my um, major professor, had this contract earlier, and he kept sending him revisions, and Commager kept saying, no, 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 it's got to be this way. And finally, Frank said, the hell with you, and published it somewhere else. Uh, that's how I got the contract, actually. But I finally uh, did outlast him. I didn't outlive him, but I outlasted him. And uh, the Confederate Nation was the result. Anyway, and beyond that, uh, I then got into biographies. I wanted to do a biography of Robert E. Lee, but a friend of mine was busy writing a biography, or he thought writing a biography. He never did it, but he had the contract to write a biography of Lee, and he was well ahead of me in the research, so I wrote a biography of Jeb Stewart. Uh, and that was fun. I had a great time with uh, this Prince of uh, Confederate Cavalry. He thought he was Jeb Stewart. Well, I'd heard that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I told him no plumes in the hat. I heard that, but I also know that uh, it is considered, along with your, your book on Lee, the definitive one volume biography of both well, of, of Stuart. Stuart was Stuart was great fun, and uh, I probably I settled on that from a uh, classroom discussion. I asked, as a sort of an introduction to history, uh, what with what historical character do you most identify? And in this period, is that is the Civil War, and. So people, people would say uh, Stonewall Jackson or Robert E. Lee or Abraham Lincoln or whomever uh, or um, uh, Sojourner Truth or whomever. And finally the students turned it on me and said, well, what, what, how would you answer this question? And I thought, and right off the top of my head I said, oh yeah, Jeb Stewart. And I, so I said, hmm, that's interesting. And so I wrote, did the Stewart biography. Then I ended up doing the Lee biography. Uh, and in the, middle of, in the middle of these, I uh, did something called Travels to Hallowed Ground, uh, in which the historian goes to historic places and figures out what's going on there now and tells stories about what happened then. Uh, that was, you know, just went around to mainly Civil War. Uh, that was just fun. Right? Yeah, it was great fun. It was great fun. Uh, and I don't know, I got to, to be ex a little expansive. I uh, went to Shiloh and uh, picked up on a Bobby Ann Mason, uh, who's a Southern writer, mm -hmm. called uh, her, she had a short story about Shiloh. And 
I played off of that some, and it was great, great. It was pure fun, and I got some, uh, University of South Carolina Press published it, and uh, we, I, I did it for a friend who was, had a series going, and um, then I moved on and did the Lee book, and then, uh, let's see. You did a Lee follow-up, too, didn't you? Yeah, I did a, something called a Robert E. Lee, an album, and that's Fran had a lot to do with that. Well, there were just wonderful visual images of places and people, portraits, weaponry, the whole thing. That You know, when you're reading a big, fat book and they've got three pages in the middle of pictures right. of what you're reading about, you're always flipping to those. So it seemed to me there were enough to do a good book to kind of go along, be a companion piece with the fatter biography. So uh, he did that. So I did out. a picture book called Robert E. Lee, an album. But it's and a narrative as well. Yeah. It's not just pictures. Yeah, it had some of the... Uh, some it does of the, look good on your coffee table, though. Yeah, <laughs> and the, some of the greatest hits from the biography, the stories about, uh, about Lee um, that I thought were, were good. As a former history major, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but the most interesting thing to me recently when I looked at it was that he wore a size four and a half shoe. Yes. How did he stand up? Well, <laughs> he, he rode a horse lot. <laughs> um, very interesting. But he, you know, he was a very active um, man all, all of his life. And one of the problems he had in the war was he had uh, the onset of angina, the heart disease. And... Um, at that point had a, had a lot of trouble uh, moving around and he got to the point where he couldn't walk from the chapel at Washington, at Washington College, which is now Washington, Washington Lee, Lee, up to his house, which he had designed for himself. Uh, and that sort of told him he was in big trouble and about to die and uh, so he just worked harder <laughs> to get more done. I think one of the true gentlemen that we feel like in, in the Well, world. I've, uh, Lee is, I think, um, undergoing right now a uh, sort of a bad persona in which uh, the American public is uh, being harangued to believe, well, he fought for slavery, therefore uh, Lee equals slavery, and slavery is bad, and Lee is evil, and I think that that is a, a, a guilt by association kind of a thing. Uh, yes, Lee did fight for the Confederacy. Yes, the Confederacy was uh, uh, one of the, the last bastion of slavery in the United States. But the Confederacy was where it was about a lot of other things too. And uh, most Americans at the time were racist anyway. Not Well, that's, that's poor were racist, period. Uh, and so Lee's views on race were not uh, atypical. Uh, they were really more um, more genteel, really, than sort of most the Americans. Sort eternal and benign, was it not? Precisely. Last night, I uh, got an email from our son, Amory, who oversees editors of several, of about 40 newspapers nationwide, and uh, he had an editor ask him the question, uh, why is it that we celebrate and venerate and admire a person who was a traitor to his country? And would you please ask Dad that? So you gave a very succinct answer to that in two sentences, and I sent it back to him, which yeah, was... My response was that he, uh, he fought for his friends and neighbors and relatives uh, against an invader. <laughs> And that's why he uh, went back on his oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. He, um, I think he thought that the United States had moved away from him. Uh, and also patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel, uh, Samuel Johnson said. And I, and I put, write that down. <laughs> I, I rather believe. So it's still a question that comes up all the time. Yeah, I'm with Betty Jean Craig. That patriotism is a suspect uh, emotion. Let's talk about presence in the university. Uh, you all have already, you, 
talked a little bit about Mr. Davison, Dr. Davison, and and uh, give us a quick your quick uh, memories of Dr. Stanford, Dr. Knapp, and Dr. Adams. Uh, Henry, 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 Henry King there, Stanford yeah. was the interim president uh, when Fred Davison resigned uh, in the midst of a uh, really a revolt and a crisis. Uh, he, I wish he'd cleaned house, <laughs> uh, but he essentially propped up the status quo and, made, and kept the university um, very much alive which the university, I think, would have stayed alive anyway. Uh, we, it's what we do. Uh, we teach classes, we check out books in the library, we mow grass and that sort of thing. And that's going to happen, regardless of whether uh, the president is in office or not. Chuck Knapp, I was, on, happened, was privileged to serve on the committee, the search committee that found Chuck Knapp, and he just I think was a great president, was here 10 years, and um, really did a number of things. The uh, minority hiring initiative that brought a lot of black faculty to the university is a product of Chuck. He, uh, he built a lot of things, and a lot of uh, the built environment uh, that now exists was the product of his planning and uh, insight into what ought to happen. Uh, I really think he was very efficient. He presided over the growth of the university and contributed a great deal to its quality. Um, I had the feeling that he was a very collegial president in that he had, he had been on a campus had been an economist yes. uh, some, but also I felt like was more a involved academically in terms of the, of the faculty and getting the feel of the faculty. He did, uh, he did. And when his early days, he had a committee of uh, seasoned faculty members uh, and he sort of ran ideas by us. Uh, he taught economics in the business school and once ranted about uh, who's in charge of this place when he couldn't find any chalk. <laughs> uh, he was a very, very fine economist who served in the Carter administration. He had taught at George Washington University. Uh, he later went to Tulane and was a, the vice president in charge of uh, everything but academics. <laughs> uh, but he was an academician and somebody in the <laughs> in the interview uh, about him getting the job, asked if he knew anything about the extension service and uh, you know, the cooperative extension service by which the university had agents in a number in all, all over Georgia in counties and uh, attempted to help those people producing the farmers uh, with the latest information on crops and soil and things like that. And <laughs> Chuck Knapp said, well, you know, Seaman Knapp was my great-grandfather, was my grandfather, and he is the one who started the cooperation, Cooperative Extension Service throughout the country. So he understood the land-grant aspects right. of yes. this university, <laughs> as well as being a strong academician. Dr. Adams? He, uh, I like uh, Adams. He's uh, always been very nice to me and I enjoy uh, visiting with him on social occasions. I've never had to work with him uh, because he was president during the last years of my tenure and I know some people who uh, have problems with him but um, <laughs> that's uh, Nell who's deaf but wants to be heard. Uh, but I think Mike Adams is, is, a, is a very fine man, and I enjoyed uh, knowing him and going to basketball games uh, in which he was sitting across the, uh, the floor. Hollering with him. Yes, yes. Instead of 
at him. And we're going to Kentucky parties with him when, when, by which we, in which we watch the Kentucky Derby in May. That sounds like a good thing. Emmy, let's talk about the Jan Kemp affair. Can you set this up for us? We've had different people in d at different times speak about parts of this, phases of it, but I don't know that we have ever had the situation that, that brought about this uh, court case explained totally. Set this up for us and then tell us how things w w progressed. Well, Jan Kemp taught in something called developmental studies, in which uh, the university, uh, in, a, in an attempt really to attract uh, a more diverse student body, uh, the university offered these, and it was in effect junior college classes taught at, by the university, by people employed by the university to teach. Uh, the idea was to get students up to speed who were came who came from disadvantaged uh, homes or poor schooling in their counties and it was not simply for athletes but a number of the athletes took advantage of it uh, and the people who directed their programs uh, had them in these developmental studies classes the rule was you had to be um, exited from those things in two years you couldn't stay there forever. You had to transfer into the big university and take essentially university courses in things like mathematics and uh, English and uh, the, the fundamental courses, the core curriculum. Uh, it, was a great, it was a good idea and the Athletic Association took advantage of it and put a number of people in those courses who they knew were not going to get out, <laughs> but they were going to have them for two years. Uh, and they were going to play and uh, be on university teams, and that was going to help the Athletic Association. <laughs> and perhaps indirectly, they thought the university. Uh, but the university, of course, is more than uh, what happens between the hedges on Saturday afternoons in the fall. And Jan Kemp uh, was a teacher there, and she was fired for essentially blowing the whistle on some of the, uh, um, well, infractions of the rules that were going on in the Developmental Studies program, in which a vice president for instruction uh, administratively exited some people so they could play in the Sugar Bowl. Uh, Jan Kemp sued the university for several million dollars and on Good Friday in 1986, I believe, uh, Jan Kemp got a, a seven million dollar verdict in her favor. And this after the university had done a lot of things silly, wrong, stupid. Uh, some, some person had said, well, we know these students are not going to uh, graduate from the university, but they'll get some education. They won't have to be garbage men. Well, immediately the, <laughs> the Atlanta Constitution found a, a broken down football player who was collecting garbage <laughs> and put him on the front page. Uh, and people who were uh, um, in sanitation departments got somewhat miffed that uh, they were being uh, relegated to uh, college dropouts. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, he said something about postal clerks, and of course, postal clerks got upset too. And so the trial was in many ways a circus, and the jury, however, gave Jan Kemp $7 million, later reduced on appeal to $3 million, but still, it's a lot of money. That the Board of Regents had to come up with uh, to pay off this suit. And the university was in a, some degree of turmoil in the middle of all of this, but the faculty never got involved. 
or at least didn't for some, some time. And finally, I lost the war of nerves, <laughs> which I think went on, and somebody had to step forward and say, hey, you know, this is a university and we're not a football machine, uh, and we do education, and that's important. Uh, and the, the athletic program should not be wagging the dog. Uh, it should be the other way around. Uh, the university ought to exist for what to teach and to inquire into the nature of things, as its motto says, and that athletics are an ancillary uh, enterprise. Well, anyway, I, a number of faculty believed this and signed petitions and uh, petitioned a meeting of the arts and sciences faculty where we, uh, following a suggestion of Milner Balls, we had a meeting of the arts and sciences faculty in which uh, we resolved to form a committee on reform to investigate. And uh, the committee was uh, made up of very, very interesting individuals. And I chaired it. And I should be able to name all these individuals, but I can't. <laughs> all different disciplines. Yeah. In the, um, yeah, we had Stan University. Longman, for example, from drama. Uh, and who was the. Who was the oh. That's okay. Yeah, anyway, uh, they became my best friends, and I now can't <laughs> name them. <laughs> uh, but. Um, Got him just in time in the interview. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we. Uh, what we did was we investigated the hell out of the university and people essentially aired all the dirty linen and uh, it, people who didn't give one damn about athletics had grudges against the administration, which was very, but tended to be arbitrary. Uh, and some of the people around Fred Davidson were uh, not as nice as he was. And so, uh, and they were all the, the university at that point the administration, wherever it had a choice, did the dumb thing. Uh, as in, uh, the law dean, Ralph Beard, said uh, when the case went to the jury, the Jan Kemp case went to the jury, uh, uh, piece of cake, we got this one. Mm -hmm. And of course he was very wrong, $7 million worth of wrong. Uh, then the Board of Regents decided that they would, uh, when they reappointed, presidents of the various uh, uh, parts of the university, of the system, uh, Georgia Tech, Georgia College, Milledgeville, Carrollton, all those places. Uh, they did that routinely in the spring, and in this, this particular spring, in 1986, they reappointed everybody but Fred Davis and set about an audit of the University of Georgia. And the audit committee was all investigating too. Meanwhile, we came in with uh, a uh, report from the Committee on Reform, had another huge uh, meeting of the, of the College of Arts and Sciences faculty, and we imagined a university like we wanted it. <laughs> uh, we had the Athletic Association as part of the the Student Affairs Department res uh, responding to the Vice President for Student Affairs uh, and made sure that athletes would not live in a specific dorm, which they had were living in then, uh, but dispersed throughout the campus. Uh, we had all, all manner of crazy ideas. <laughs> And uh, it, it, you know, the meanwhile the Davidson administration uh, was in, in some cases fighting back, uh, sniping at the reformers, and the Board of Regents was not renewing Fred's contract, and Fred got upset about that, and. When they did it a second meeting of the Board of Regents, he sent in his resignation. Believing that this was a bluff, they couldn't stand this, 
they would have to reappoint him then and knuckle under to whatever he wanted. Uh, well, no, Dean Probst, the chancellor, accepted that resignation uh, the day it arrived. And because Fred Davidson had been a rival of Dean Probst for the chancellorship. And Dean Probst was this wonderful uh, man with a, Van with a Vanderbilt background who believed that the university had overstepped itself uh, in administrative uh, arbitrariness and also the athletic program. He pointed, well, he said to me on private occasion that the university would not uh, submit to uh, being a second-rate athletic power, but uh, it wasn't going to act like it had been doing, uh, which was uh, not educating its scholar-athletes. 